Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still, sin- still were sinners, Christ died for us. The word of God for the people of God. <clears throat> so last week, uh, I began a very short series on uh, answering a calling that God has in our life. Now, you all, uh, unless you felt like going to Kleins Grove after church, didn't get to hear the first part of that sermon, and that's okay, because I think it's one you're probably familiar with. Um, I joked with Kleins Grove last week that they got the bad sermon this week. Normally, they get the good sermon, right? You guys get the bad sermon every week. Did you know that? Yeah, the first one, exactly. So I do it here the first time. Um, hopefully it goes well, but usually the second time I get to do it, I call that the good sermon because I've worked out all the kinks. So they, they had the bad sermon last week, but you guys get it every week. I'm sorry. That's right. So I want you to think about this. Whenever you meet someone new in your life or maybe think about when you've been on a job interview in your life, it always seems like that conversation uh, or the interaction that takes place, it almost seems to repeat itself every time, right? Like there's a a repetition to how we communicate with one another when we are just starting to know somebody. And the conversation almost always goes something like this. Hi, I'm Eric. Hi, I'm John or whoever. Nice to meet you. So tell me about yourself, John. Are you married? Do you have kids? Oh, you do? How old are they? Where did you grow up? Oh, you grew up here. So when did you graduate? Okay, so do you know such and such that graduated around the same time you did? Oh, you don't. Well, do you have brothers and sisters? And eventually, as we go through these small talk questions with people getting to know them, we almost always come to this question, what is it that you do? Or where do you work? It's funny, we really define ourselves and our self-worth by that question. Now, I'm guessing that when you answer that question, you also get follow-up questions, right? Oh, you're a nurse. Do you work with young people or the old? Oh, you're a farmer. Well, what do you grow? What do you raise? Where's your farm at? Do you know what I get? Oh, you're, you're a pastor. And sometimes it's, that's the end of the conversation, right? Or sometimes the blood drains from people's faces whenever I, whenever I say that to them. Um, oftentimes I get something like, well, I guess I better be on my best behavior then. No, I almost always get this. Where is your church at? That is usually the question that I get as a follow-up. See, the truth is that we do value what we do for a living. We know that each of us, what we do has a purpose, and it fulfills some kind of need that others may have. But my question for you today is this. What is the work that Jesus wants us to be doing? Have you ever thought about defining what you do by the work that you do for Jesus? instead of the work that you do for money. It's kind of a different way of defining what it is that you do, right? 
Now, often when we broach this subject of doing things for Jesus or working for Jesus or, or getting more involved in things in the church, we hear things like this. I'd love to get involved, but I'm just so busy. I'd love to get more involved, but I am really tired. I'd love to get involved again, but I feel like my time for doing that work has passed. Which is a nice way that people usually say, I'm feeling kind of old and I don't want to do it anymore. I'd like to get involved, but I just don't think I'm good enough to serve. Now, I know that some pastors will hear things like that as a response. And they almost automatically begin to berate people when they give them that response. What do you mean you're too busy? You're too busy for Jesus? What do you mean you're too tired? You're too tired to serve Jesus? What do you mean your time has passed? You're still here, aren't you? What do you mean you're not good enough? Well, you better start getting right because time's a wasting. I will be entirely honest with you, and I don't believe this will probably come as a surprise to you, but I do not like that response when talking to people. I think that trying to guilt people into working for Jesus is not right. And more importantly, I don't believe it's what Jesus would want us to be doing. I think that when we react in that way, in that negative way right away, we're actually missing an opportunity. We're missing a chance to talk to people about what is going on in their lives. And we're missing a chance to be in service to them. You're too busy. Is there anything that I can do to help you? You're too tired. Is there anything I can do to help you get some rest? Your time has passed. I thank you for all that you have done in the past. Is there a new area that you've always wanted to try out, but you didn't have the chance to? You're not good enough. Well, have you accepted Jesus? And do you need help leaving something behind in your life that's dragging you down? You see, we're reminded in our scripture for today that we have all the tools that we need to do work for Jesus. Now, sure, we all have our areas that we can be more effective in, but we all have the ability to do something. See, we are told that we are to boast in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And that hope doesn't disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Because while we were still weak, at that right time, Christ died for the ungodly. You see, all those things that might be holding us back, all those things that might be getting in our way of serving God are things that God can turn to his glory. As I was thinking about this week, I was reminded of a person that I know that's a pastor in Lewistown. Now, this guy, he is the same age as I am, and he has had a difficult life. He didn't know Jesus when we were younger, and he tried to fill the hole inside of his life by turning to drugs. He found himself addicted, and then ultimately he overdosed and nearly died. When he was finally able to get clean, it was through his decision to follow Jesus. He now runs the youth ministry in his church. He goes around the country speaking to youth about Jesus and also speaking to people with addictions about Jesus. He meets with them and tells them how Jesus changed his life and how he can change theirs. It is because of this addiction that he had in his life, he knows where they are. He knows how they're feeling, and he is very successful in talking to them. You see, Jesus used a terrible time in this man's life to allow him to really understand the struggles that people are going through. Now, as I was preparing the sermon for this week, I came across an article that reminded me that Jesus 
wasn't one to sit and do nothing. Now he did take time to go and pray, but I would argue that praying is not doing nothing. But he was always moving, always working to go to people and talk to them about how they could be saved. And in that same article, the writer broke down the people that followed Jesus into two categories. There is the crowd and there is the community. And he defined the crowd that followed Jesus this way. These people occupy the same space together, but each person is there to meet individual needs, to satisfy individual hungers. They might share with others or they might not. It doesn't matter much to them. They come in and they go out. And the value they place on their gathering is on whether their needs were met or at least acknowledged. The crowd is acutely aware of the struggle of their lives. They are harassed constantly and burdened by living, and they don't know what to do about it. They are looking for a leader who will bring them some comfort and solace, and they will likely follow any shepherd who comes along. They are like hungry sheep who hope this shepherd knows where the food is and can bring some light into their personal darkness. So the crowd he defines as a group of people that are there gathering together, but they're just there to fulfill their own personal needs. He defined the community this way. A community exists for one another and is open to those who haven't yet found their way in. It isn't about meeting needs or satisfying hungers. The community is about building relationships. It is about belonging and serving. The secret that each member of the community knows is that individual hungers are more satisfied in service to others, in the hospitality that puts others before self in setting aside personal preferences in favor of the attempt to see others and to see the world through others' eyes. The members of the community do not starve themselves. They don't deny their own neediness, but discover, surprisingly, they are satisfied by labor in the Lord's harvest. This, in part, is because the needs and the hungers change when they are taken out of ourselves long enough to love someone else and in part because the deeper need connects them to love and to know and be known are sometimes redefined as something more like happiness or, re or recognition something more than happiness or recognition so the community exists to serve others finds that it is fed in service and in turn finds that their needs are met because of that labor. Well, brothers and sisters, what is the church today? Are we a crowd or are we a community? Are we existing simply to take care of our own needs or are we existing to serve others? Are we here just to ensure our own salvation or are we here to take the message of Jesus to others so that they might be saved? It's a hard question to answer. The truth is that it must be done by each and every one of us. Are we just worried about ourselves? Or are we going to be committed to working to help others? Now, I think if we want to call ourselves disciples of Christ, the choice is obvious. That we must be a community instead of a crowd. Yes, we might be tired. Yes, we might be busy. Yes, we might be feeling old. And yes, there are moments when we don't feel good enough to serve. But we have to remember that through Jesus, all these problems are taken away. All these doubts are washed away. And there is no greater way to feel rejuvenated and new than to be in service to others in the name of Jesus Christ. If you've ever felt the power and sense of peace that comes when you've helped someone come to know Jesus, I want you to remember that feeling. 
Remember how in that moment nothing else seemed as important? There was no need to rest because you were so inspired. There was no room for doubt in your heart because it was full of the Spirit. That, brothers and sisters, is how we build a community. One that is focused on the work that God has called us to do. So let us commit ourselves this day to being a community of faith and not just a crowd of faith. Brothers and sisters, it is time to go to work. My challenge for you this week is this. What's one thing you can do this week to serve others? Go and do it. Amen.